15th lecture on an introduction to the New Testament. We will first look at Philippians. Then we will study the Apostle Paul's pastoral epistles. Paul wrote Philippians for the church of Philippi while he was imprisoned. Philippi was an important city of Macedonia. Paul, who was in Troas, saw a vision of a Macedonian man asking him to come and help, which made Paul cease his mission's plan in Asia and go to Philippi in Macedonia. Philippi was the first place where Paul preached the gospel. Another reason why Paul went to the church of Philippi is he wanted to express his gratitude for the gifts the believers of Philippi had sent him. He probably wanted to show them his thanks, tell them about himself, and encourage the church of Philippi to not lose heart. In addition to these things, Paul went to teach the church of Philippi, which was internally affected by factions and divisions, to have the heart of Christ and to remember Christ's humility. Paul entreats Euodia and Syntyche to labor as they had in the past. Chapter 4, verse 2. The church of Philippi had been influenced by Judaist and legalistic teachings. Calling these false teachers dogs in Philippians, Paul in chapter 3 instructs them to look out for these people and to boast only in Christ. Paul could have trusted in his flesh, but for Christ, he counted his gains as losses because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Paul admonishes them to rejoice in the Lord. For this reason, Philippians is sometimes called the letter joy. The word joy appears 16 times in Philippians. In the face of suffering and death, Paul rejoiced in seeing Christ proclaimed. For this reason, Philippians teaches Christians the things in which we should sincerely rejoice. For the letter's conclusion, Paul thanks 
the believers of the church of Philippi for their love, and he blesses them and ends the letter with a greeting. As we read this letter, we must rejoice in the Lord and do what is true and what is honorable. We must also have Christ's heart, following after Christ in our lives. Until now, we have studied telling epistles. Finally, we will study the pastoral epistles. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are the pastoral epistles. The name was this name was first used by German theologian Paul Anton in seventeen twenty six. These three epistles are called the pastoral epistles because they deal with the matters concerning pastors and the duties of pastors. These epistles teach us how ministers of the gospel like Timothy and Titus are to handle church affairs. For these reasons, the three books are called the Pastoral Epistles. The Pastoral Epistles are tied to the last part of ministry. Many things concerning the end times of Paul's life are unknown. Acts talks only briefly about the things that Paul did in his two years in Rome. Scholars differ in their opinion of what Paul specifically did following these two years. People typically assume that Paul before great persecution happened, arrived in Rome and spent two years under house arrest and was pardoned to live freely for a little while. After Paul was released from his first imprisonment in Rome, he was relatively free, and it was during this time that he wrote First Timothy and Titus. It so Paul wrote Second Timothy during his second imprisonment in the time before he was martyred. We do not know if Paul actually went to Spain. Clement, who was the first father of Rome, said that Paul went to the end of Europe. Because we have this testimony, some people claim that Paul did make it to Spain. Moving forward, if we look at 1 Timothy and Titus, Paul encourages Titus to come to Nicopolis, a city on the western coast of Greece. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul requests 
that he come to Rome before winter. This is to believe that there was a gap between the writing of First Timothy and the writing of Second Timothy. The place where the letter was written changed from Nicopolis to Rome. Timothy was with Paul when Paul wrote the prison epistles. But because Timothy and Paul were not together when Paul wrote the pastoral epistles, Paul writes to Timothy. Therefore, Paul did not write this letter during his first imprisonment in Rome, which is found in Acts chapter 28. He wrote this letter at another time when he was imprisoned in Rome. At the content of First Timothy. First Timothy is Paul's letter to Timothy during his first missionary journey. Paul evangelized in Lystra, and this is probably where Timothy first met Paul and received the gospel. According to Paul's words, Timothy had faith without deceit, a faith that probably came from his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. This tells us that Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois taught him the Bible since he was a boy. Raised by his godly mother and grandmother in a family of faith from a young age, Timothy was able to accept the gospel when Paul evangelized him. Timothy received compliments in the church from his brothers in Lystra and Iconium, the places where he lived. Acts chapter 16, verse 2. Paul, who was on his second missionary journey, passed by the area and brought Timothy with him to serve in ministry. Timothy maintained a close relationship with Paul as he worked alongside him. <clears throat> Timothy was with Paul when Paul wrote his prison epistles during his first imprisonment in Rome. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 says that Paul urged Timothy to remain in Ephesus. And when Paul was writing this letter, Timothy was ministering to the church of Ephesus. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says, 
let no one despise you for your youth. Which means Timothy was ministering at a relatively young age. Paul desired to go quickly to Timothy, but because things did not happen as he planned, he wrote to him to teach him the things that were urgent. This is First Timothy. If we study the content of First Timothy, Paul first greets Timothy in the introduction. Paul calls Timothy my true child in the faith. We need to preach the gospel and have more people be born in the faith. After the greeting, Paul explains the purpose behind leaving Timothy at Ephesus. He did it to protect the church from false teachers and cult ideologies and to bear witness to God's glorious gospel. He admonishes Timothy to fight the good fight for the gospel of glory. <clears throat> for example, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18 says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously of that by them you may wage the good warfare. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul urges Timothy to put praying for all people above all other things as he takes part in ministry. The reason for this is God wants all people to be saved. Chapter 2 also teaches about how men and women in a community are to act in orderly fashion and in purity. Men should lift their holy hands to maintain peace, and they must pray. Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, not with gold or pearls or costly attire, as they dwell in faith, love, and holiness. 1 Timothy G, the qualifications for overseers and deacons, chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. These verses provide us with biblical standards for today's pastors, elders, and deacons. God delights in the church appointing workers like pastors, elders, and deacons to preach the gospel and firmly build up the church. Therefore, the church must adhere to the biblical standards for appointing faithful church workers. Because the qualifications for those who serve in the church found in 1 Timothy chapter 3 are important, we should study the text closely and take 
a deeper look at it. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit again warns against false teachers and false teachings. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 to 16 says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. It also says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. The Apostle Paul asks the young pastor Timothy to do this, and the Lord asks and encourages all ministers of the gospel to do the same. We must always remember hearts. Chapter 5 teaches us how we are to treat older people and younger people, old men and old women, young men and young women, true widows and elders. This chapter teaches pastors how they are to lead the various kinds of people within the church. Chapter 6 verse 2 says, Teach and urge these things. This message is not only for Timothy. When it says, teach and urge these things, it is a lesson for the entire church. In chapter 6, Paul continues to inform Timothy about the attitude a minister of the gospel must carry. He tells him not to that God is a means of gain. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, Fight the good fight of faith. He tells him not to set his hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Paul instructs Timothy to do good. With these words of admonishment, the Apostle Paul concludes the letter with these words in chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. Let us read the verse. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace with the Apostle Paul's twelfth epistle is Titus. Titus is Paul's letter to Titus and the churches of Crete. Titus chapter 1 verse 4, chapter 3 verse 15. Titus is not mentioned in Acts 
but he is frequently mentioned in Paul's epistles as a faithful fellow worker. By reading the Bible, we can see that Titus was a Greek, not a Jew. Galatians chapter 2 tells us that Paul did not force Titus to be circumcised. Paul did this to make it more clear that faith alone leads to salvation. Titus accompanied Paul and Barnabas when they went from Antioch to them to paint in the Jerusalem Council. Galatians chapter 2 verse 1 In order to examine the state of the church of Corinth, Titus visited Corinth and reported to Paul the news that the church of Corinth was repenting. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 6 to 10 He was a Gentile, but having Paul's faith, Titus was Paul's spiritual son, a fellow worker, and a worker of the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 23 Titus chapter 1 verse 4 Titus chapter 1 verse 5 reads This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Paul left Titus on the island of Crete. He was appointed as pastor to remain there and look after the churches. Paul says he writes this epistle from Nicopolis which is located on the western coast of Greece. Titus chapter 3 verse 12 But if we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20, which was written after Titus was written, it says that Titus went to Dalmatia. We believe Titus, after meeting Paul in Nicopolis, went to Dalmatia, which is modern-day Yugoslavia, to evangelize. Titus, like Paul, had an untiring passion for evangelism. Titus set valuable for all pastors of future generations. Following the initial greeting, Paul, in chapter 1 verses 5 to 9, writes about the standards for appointing elders in the towns. He describes what kind of people the elders must be, listing 15 qualifications these people must have. <clears throat> As does 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus describes the virtues that those who serve and those who minister in the church must have. In chapter 1 verses 10 to 16, 
Paul warns Titus against the spreading of the false teachings of false teachers who are called the circumcision party. Paul tells Titus to sign out false teachers and to sharply rebuke believers who are tempted. Titus chapter 2 is a teaching for the various types of people within the church. It is similar to what we saw in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Titus chapter 2 teaches us how we are to guide and lead old men and old women, young women, and bond servants. Because 1 Timothy and Titus were written around the same time, they are similar in content and are alike in many ways. Pastors in the church must demonstrate leadership. There is something pastors must especially be aware of when guiding church members. Chapter 2 verse 8 Chapter 2 verse 7 says, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. It is telling pastors to be a model of godliness. All members of the community must have self-control, be sober-minded, obey one another, be godly and patient, speak sound words, and be a model of good faith. All these things are done so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Chapter 2, verse 10 Chapter 2, verses 11 to 14 is a core truth of the gospel that must be taught to all workers of the gospel. We need to be aware of this and remember it. Titus is made. Now we will move on to Titus chapter 3. Chapter 3 includes teachings about a Christian's life within the family and the church. It is about how a Christian is to live in the world. Titus tells us to submit to our rulers and be gentle toward all people. Chapter 3 verses 1 to 2 In society, Christians should not live as lawless people, but they need to respect the authority of those who have authority. We need to live as good members of society. We must be patient with people who do illegal and evil things and preach the gospel. Why do we have to do? Paul says this. In the past, the believers in Crete were foolish, disobedient people, but by God's mercy, they received the grace of salvation 
and regeneration, which made them into people who do good works. Chapter 3, verses 3 to 8. Paul concludes his letter to Titus by telling him to avoid false teachers' foolish controversies, genealogies, and dissensions, and he makes a personal request and gives his final greeting. Chapter 3, verses 9 to 15. We will move on to Paul's 13th epistle. It is 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was the last of the pastoral epistles and the last of all of the epistles written. For this reason, 2 Timothy is also called Paul's will. Paul was once again imprisoned and in shackles when he wrote 2 Timothy. Let us read 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Paul knew that he was soon to be executed. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 6 says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Even still, Paul did not fear before death, but he thought about Timothy, the church, and he desired for the church on this earth to be firmly built. Paul says the church is the house of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 20 It is the church of the living God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 chapter 3 verse 15 The church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. They are God's own people. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 The church is the body of Christ, the temple of God. Paul loved the church. Paul, through the preaching of the gospel of Christ, devoted his entire life to build the holy church on this earth. The time had come for Paul to be martyred, but in his heart he had only love and concern for the church. Timothy, last letter written by this Paul. Paul opens his letter to Timothy by calling him his beloved child. Paul, reminiscing of the time he met Timothy, the work he did with Timothy, and Timothy's relentless faith, gives thanks to God. Chapter 1 verses 3 to 5 Paul says to Timothy, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel 
by the power of God. Chapter 1, verse 8. Paul expects Timothy to suffer in the future in the way he suffered when preaching the gospel. So he encourages Timothy to prepare for this suffering. Paul the time Timothy was called to serve. Let us read verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Christ abolished death and brought life through the gospel. Paul reminds Timothy that he was appointed preacher and apostle and teacher for this gospel. Chapter 1 verses 10 to 11 In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul commands Timothy to be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus to boldly carry out this ministry. Verse 1 Because Timothy received the gospel that Paul preached, he must now teach and entrust this gospel to faithful men. Verse 2 To be used by God, we cleanse ourselves. Chapter 2, verse 21 In the last days, people will love themselves, love money, be wicked, corrupt, ungodly, heartless, and have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 these signs of the last days are seen in our generation. What does Paul admonish Timothy about in chapter 3? He says that the main reason people are corrupt in their hearts is they have abandoned the truth. Therefore, Paul advises Timothy to learn and firmly believe. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 to 17. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is Paul's final request and greeting. The message of chapter 4 is to preach the word, whether in season or out. Of season. Paul was about to die. He makes a personal request to Timothy and finishes the letter with a final greeting. Chapter 4 verses 19 to 22. We too must proclaim the gospel. When we are near to finishing the work of bearing witness to God's gospel of grace, we must not in the least bit value our lives. Like Paul, we must finish the race, keep our faith, and live for the gospel. This concludes the 15th lecture on an introduction to the New Testament. Thank you.